Good morning. Thank you, Emily. Uh, thanks for joining us for this morning's edition of DSA Virtual Access. It's beautiful and cold in Seattle today, and we're meeting three recently hired leaders of big public agencies, which all have an impact on how we live and work and play in Seattle and Puget Sound. All three are dedicated public servants in the best sense of that word with long careers in other parts of the country, and we're lucky to have them working for us now. Uh, this morning, we're going to learn what brought them to Seattle, what their initial impressions are, and what their biggest priorities are, how they'll steer challenging projects with diverse stakeholders from planning through execution. We'll talk about agency-specific things, but we'll also what, look at um, some potential interesting collaboration between these three different people and agencies. But first, before we, we begin the conversation, we always do brief introductions. A.P. Diaz was named superintendent of the Seattle Parks Department, Department of Parks and Recreation in September of this year. Seattle Parks and Recreation manages nearly 500 parks and natural areas in a total of about 6,500 acres. As superintendent, AP leads department efforts to create clean, safe, accessible public spaces. He previously served as the executive officer and assistant general manager for the Los Angeles Department of Recreation and Parks. Greg Spots became director of the Seattle Department of Transportation also in September of this year. Previously, he led the Los Angeles Bureau of Street Services, known as Streets LA, where he oversaw a staff of 1,500, an annual budget of 230 million, and a capital program of more than $350 million. He also led the delivery of over $600 million in American Recovery and Reinvestment Act projects. Julie Tim was named CEO of Sound Transit in June of this year. So she's the grizzled veteran having had two extra, three extra months of the, more than these other guys. That agency provides light rail, commuter rail, and bus service connecting more than 50 cities and the nearly 50% of Washington State residents who live in the Puget Sound area. Before joining Sound Transit, Julie was a CEO of the Greater Richmond Transit Company, where she oversaw the operation of regional bus routes and more than 400 employees. Now, we have some questions we prepared in advance, and we'll get to audience questions more formally in the last part of the program, but definitely, as Emily mentioned, um, use the chat box and, uh, and type out your questions, and I'll try and incorporate those into the conversation flow as we're, as we're going along this morning. Uh, let's see. Now, um, we, there's lots to cover. Each, each of these different agencies has huge portfolios that impact pretty much all of us every day, but I want to start with kind of the most basic question with a slight little twist, and that would be... Um, We'll start with AP, um, but we'll do this. I'd like all three of you answer this question. Why did you take this job? And were you aware of uh, two things, the Seattle freeze and the Seattle process before you signed your contract? <laughs> Great question. Well, good morning, Felix. Good morning, everyone. Um, I took this job because it's challenging and because I really have a heart and passion for parks and open spaces. I saw firsthand as did cities all around the world, the role that parks played uh, during the pandemic. And for me, as Seattle was beginning to come, you know, through and out of the panic pa pandemic, I realized that uh, there would be much opportunity in Seattle, which by the way, I describe as one huge park with just a bunch of little villages and neighborhoods inside of it. And so it's a, it's a dream for a park professional to lead and manage a city as rich in natural beauty as Seattle. I also came uh, to capture the mayor's vision uh, of doing things differently, thinking outside of the box, stepping outside of the box. And so I'm really challenged to do that. And uh, I heard about the Seattle freeze, but fortunately I've not experienced a lot of it. To the contrary, uh, everyone has been warm and welcoming and uh, on that note, I've coined a new phrase for our department, which is Seattle shines. And I can talk about that more a little later, but happy to be here. But no Seattle process? No one warned you about the Seattle process? No one warned me about the process. I think they wanted okay. me to come take the job. So, you okay. know, they couldn't share everything. <laughs> we, we will. I do want to get to the Seattle shines definitely later in the show. That, I think it's an intriguing concept. Um, how about Greg Spots? What about you? Why did you take this job? And were you aware of all the uh, potential pitfalls before you said yes? So a weird dynamic is like, I meet a lot of people in Seattle and they're really nice. And then like 20 minutes into it, they say, so what are you going to do about the Seattle freeze? <laughs> and I tell them, uh, I'm thinking like, but you're being nice. Why, why is that a thing right now? So I tell them, you know, I'm going to melt it down with some California sunshine. So one, uh, one person then said to me, you know, Greg, I've been with you for about an hour. I think you're in the 99th percentile of friendliness in Seattle. 
<laughs> I think AP is in the 99th percentile too. Um, but uh, I asked her, should I take it down to, you know, 92? Um, so the uh, people have been very welcoming and that's been great. Um, I took the job for three reasons. I had visited here three times in the last five years, and I watched how the waterfront began to be transformed as the a viaduct was first turned off and then torn down. And that made me think they do big things here in Seattle. I also had spent some time visiting South Lake Union as it transformed. Um, and the streetscape that went in, the sort of pedestrian oriented, you know, streetcar oriented, um, you know, large sidewalks, beautiful rain gardens, um, you know, sort of created a really attractive environment. And now I choose to live in South Lake Union for that reason. And then, um, you know, meeting Mayor Harrell was profound for me, um, you know, talking to somebody who ran for election on a unity platform in late 2021, that seemed sort of audacious and exciting to me. Um, and we really had a meeting of the minds about, you know, investing in underserved communities by co-creating projects with them. And I think um, navigating the Seattle process is going to turn out to be one of the most important parts of my job, because we need to have broader outreach at the beginning to a wider range of stakeholders, rather than meeting the same established stakeholders over and over again who want to tell you why we shouldn't do the project. So a chance to reinvent the whole idea of what it means to be the director of the Department of Transportation is what it sounds like you're talking about. Um, what about, <laughs> that's, you know, I, I, I like, I think, I think Seattle loves a good idea. I think Seattle loves um, ambitious leaps toward the future. So depending on how the next couple of years go, I think you might be in a, you know, you might've arrived here at the perfect time. Um, Julie, what about you? What was, why did you come to Seattle from sweet little East Coast, nice and calm, no lightning rods, no, uh, oh. no Seattle process, no Seattle freeze? <laughs> what lured you from there? That's funny. So <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of politics on the East Coast. Um, and honestly, I wasn't looking to leave. I was the CEO of Greater Richmond Transit Company, been there for three years, and really was looking to implement a a vision plan on moving that agency forward with a lot of very key initiatives. And when I got the call, I got a call to ask to apply. I'm like, oh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, in here. I'm, I'm in it to win it. I got these ideas and we're going to see how it goes. Uh, and I looked up Sound Transit. I looked up the Puget Sound region. And the more I did research on the vision and mission of Sound Transit and what this region was doing, uh, the more excited I became about the possibilities of what, what is going on here. And when I say possibilities of what I co what's going on here, I really mean the reality of what's going on here as a leader and a vision and a, an impressive, audacious program that the entire nation is watching. It's the largest capital improvement program for transit in the country. And it is leading the way in transitioning people from cars into walking and biking and buses and light rail all together in this integrated, wonderful melting pot of mobility initiatives. So what you said right before leading in is that Seattle and this region seems to be filled with people who want that ambitious possibility, that open, that, that dialogue, and they want to be involved. And they want to, they want to lead the way. I'm like, you know, I think maybe these are my people. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I came and I interviewed and got through the process. And I have found Seattle Freeze hasn't seemed to be a thing for me either. As the others have said, everyone has been amazingly open and really optimistic about the possibilities. Yeah, there, there's, some, there's some little sharp edges here and there about you know, how are we gonna do it better and how are we gonna fix some of the issues? But there is also a lot of optimism for these generational investments that really connect our communities. So I haven't found a lot about the Seattle Freeze but yeah, the Seattle process, I was warned about that. It is a thing. And I, like Greg, think I want to lean into that some. Yeah, everyone wants to have a, a, a vision. They want to have a voice in the process. They want to know the details of why were decisions made that way. But I have found so far in my shelter little world, my echo chamber, that when we're transparent, we, we give people that information and listen to their voices. They buy in. And instead of pulling against people to try and create this vision, we're pulling with people 
on this vision. And I get more of, not of, well, we shouldn't do that, more of how can we do it faster? How can we do it better? Uh, and that's, you know, wrapping it back around why I came here is I'm not pulling against a system to do the right thing. I'm pulling with a lot of people to do more of the right thing. It's very inspirational. Yeah, I like what each, I think the common element that I see in what each of the three of you have said, um, you're all from elsewhere, obviously, two, two of you from LA, one from the East Coast, but you all like, thousands of people before, hundreds of thousands of people before you were attracted to come to Seattle by the possibilities. And I think that that speaks to my love of Seattle and hopefully a lot of people joining us this morning, that notion of in spite of what might be in the immediate future or what we're getting out of in terms of recent challenges, there is this larger goal to reach toward. Um, and you mentioned, uh, you know, that no, this notion of generational uh, investments, uh, Julie. And I think that kind of language, I, I, I am very much attracted to that kind of language because I think that's, that's how these things have to be described. These are, these are huge projects, as you said, the largest uh, infrastructure investment in, in public transportation. How do you balance those, those generational investments and the aspirations of that with the, you know, yet another delay on this particular line, or it's not going to be 2025, it's going to be 2097, you know, I'm, and I'm exaggerating, but how do you balance the 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 blue sky stuff with the day to day and the percentage of the population who is often quite cynical about the public sector um, delivering on promises. How do you how do you balance that in I, in Seattle specifically, or what what's been your experience in the six months you've been here? And I'll, we'll ask I'll ask, the, I'll ask you as well the other two guys. Let's start with Julie on this one. Well, let me so if I can clarify one thing. So I was off of the job in June, but like I said, I was very very committed to what I was doing in Richmond. I had a lot of irons in the fire, a lot of processes that I was beginning. So I actually didn't arrive here until September 26th with my first day. Okay. I think I'm actually the youngest of, of the group when it comes to tenure here so far. Uh, but my commitment to Richmond was there were policies and there were, um, there were initiatives that needed to be really set in place before I left. I had a promise to my staff on things I would do for them. Uh, so it took me a little while to get here. With that said, how do you balance this generational investment, this vision, this passion, desire to move things forward with ongoing repeated delays? Okay. Yeah, it, it is. It's challenging. And you, you balance it with honesty and transparency. You, you balance it by daylight and the fact that these aren't easy projects. We're going from what, 26 miles to pretty soon opening up to 62 miles will be our total that by the time we're done with Sound Transit 3, ST3, we'll have 112 miles of light rail, 46 miles of BRT, another 10 miles of Sounder, uh, and, and not including all the other development and initiatives and construction and parking garages and connectivity and bike lanes, and it's massive. And there are going to be delays and there are going to be setbacks. And as inflation hits, as COVID hits, as we have you know, concrete strikes as we have delays, as we have internal problems, and those are there. Transparency and honesty, let people know what we're doing, level set expectations, and then we just move forward and we keep pushing. But we do it with integrity, knowing that we're doing a safe project. We're doing it with, um, with our ethics held high and our integrity, as far as making sure that we have equity in what we're doing, and that we have quality. We're not going to push so hard and so fast that we trample on any of those three things. And I think that this is a region that would understand that and does understand that so long as we're honest and transparent about it. And that's how you balance it. Yeah, I think that communication element is is absolutely critical to all of this in terms of the transparency, but also like uh, spinning a narrative, not, not spinning in the negative sense, but creating a narrative that people can understand. And so they look toward that distant distant goal and understand there's going to be ups and downs along the way. Greg, how does this apply to the to your portfolio that you have at, at SDOT? You know, I think one thing I'm impressing on the staff is we have to deliver from the very smallest thing to the medium-sized things to the big things. Um, when I was um, cleaning out my office in Los Angeles, I found this PowerPoint that I made 10 years ago in my first week on the job. And I had I was telling the big boss that what Streets LA needed to build public confidence was to be responsive, innovative, transparent, and accountable. 
And I was really surprised seeing that because if you asked my staff, people I'd promoted several times over the course of the decade, what is Greg all about? They would have given you at least two of those four words, responsive, innovative, transparent, and accountable. So I decided to bring that up here. And you know, um, uh, SDOT has six values and the last one is excellence. So I told the staff, I'm gonna define excellence as being responsive, innovative, transparent, and accountable. And that means, you know, like yesterday, midday, somebody sent, you know, tweeted at me a picture of the ice covered Burke Gilman Trail. And I had my staff contact AP staff because we share responsibilities for different segments of that. And by three o'clock, we had some people out there plowing that part of the trail. Um, and sometimes the goodwill you create from that will help you on a $10 million, $20 million bus rapid transit project on the corridor. Um, I've made the theme for 2023 delivery fast and flavorful. I want us to meet our targets and I want us the projects to fully realize their goals rather than be watered down. So um, it's not going to be a year about shiny new ideas. It's a year about delivering what we promised. Okay. Now, and AP with the part you mentioned, Seattle is a, is one big park that people happen to live in. Um, that means that we're all, all of us are stepping through Seattle Parks land or coming into contact with, with the Seattle Parks system almost almost unknowingly sometimes. So what does that mean for the challenges you face in this sort of big picture versus the day-to-day? -day? Yeah, that's a great question. It, what it means is that all of us in Seattle are living and managing the park system together. Uh, these parks, these neighborhood parks, these regional parks, these city parks, they're part of our identity. And people in their neighborhoods identify with their park system. Um, as you mentioned, every single day, in some fashion or form, you are navigating a park. And talk about generational investments. I think, you know, the proof in that pudding is the Metropolitan Park District funding. Uh, that came into place just as I was joining the Seattle team, where Seattleites said, we're willing to invest and pay up to $800 million for our park system. That alone makes Seattle the most funded park system per capita than any other city in North America. So that sort of generational investment is huge. What was so amazing about that process was the participation and the input uh, that many communities had to make to get to a point where they felt comfortable to renew the funding, to vote for it again, and then to have city leaders vote for it. So in this sense, people know what's coming. Um, their expectations are there. And now it's our job to continue to work with them to shape and develop. The great thing about parks is they serve the needs of many different people. And I love to talk about the love languages of parks. Um, I meet people every single day from different neighborhoods in Seattle. And one moment I'll be talking with a group of really enthused environmentalists, um, these dear people at Seward Park who want to take me on night L walks and want to show me where the eagles nest. And then 10 minutes later, I'll be meeting with other constituents on the other side of town. And their love language is not uh, the owls or the environment. It's sport and athletics and uh, the right types of fields for sports. And then you'll meet people uh, just a little bit later that have a different love language. Their love language is uh, running and trails and wanting more uh, you know, natural spaces to do that. So to me, that's really encouraging. And the goal in that or the message is really to remind everyone that we have common ground and connection to parks, but we may have individual differences or individual interests. Um, but with a system of nearly 500 parks, uh, I love the fact that we get to really sort of deliver on some portion or all of those love languages somewhere in each park system. And you know, you guys have each touched on this a little bit um, in terms of the communications and the the um, kind of the the 21st century approach, like responding to a tweet about a, a trail being needing to be plowed. Um, it seems like we're it's it's you know it's not your it's not the earlier generations. Uh, public servant. I mean, my father worked for the city of Seattle for 27 years in the 60s to the 80s, you know, obviously before all these major advances in technology. And 
it, it was a very different world when he was working for what was called the building department back then. Um, so you're, you have a potential to be in contact with the public constantly all the time. And it seems like each of you are using social media to a different degree to, um, kind of make that face-to-face -face connection or have that high touch with, with the citizens of Seattle. I imagine that has pluses as well as minuses. Um, how do you deal with the, with the barrage of social media when it's something negative? I mean, have you had experiences with that, Julie? Yes, I, I, I have. So I originally was told early in my career, uh, don't, don't post on social media, um, keep your comment short and don't answer a question that's not specifically directly asked and, and even then only give the minimum amount of information. Uh, clearly, I didn't take that advice. Uh, I, I, I wanted to, when I went to Richmond, I wanted to lean into this idea of using my position as a CEO to really be transparent and to make that office accessible to all the staff and all the writers and the public so that it, it was a, a different model than what I had seen uh, in across the, the nation as far as what CEOs did and how they, they did their job. And I did get some pushback. Uh, there were times when people did, especially the beginning of COVID, I'll be honest, and with, during BLM, I, I did tweet my activities and there were people that didn't like it. Um, for various reasons. And uh, there got to be some even people who made some very um, life-threatening uh, and uh, tweets towards me. I don't think any of them were credible. I think in the New England area, the life-threatening tweets can be a little bit more dramatic, I'm told. You just have to make sure that you understand what's a, uh, what of that negativity you really wanna um, lean into. And I have chosen to not that if it's negative, I try and take the high road, that I, I provide an empathetic answer that sometimes when someone's tweeting, what they're saying and the attack that they're saying has an underlying frustration. And I try and address that underlying frustration and not the words in the attack. Um, I try and if, if it is clearly an attack and that's it, I ignore it and I pass it on to the police if it needs to be, or just ignore it. it, it I don't need to engage in that negativity. If it's truly a question that's asking and it feels negative, again, I try and hear the frustration, give empathy, and then answer that way. And it, it's been mostly successful. Um, and I think it's been appreciated. It doesn't take much for the Twitter world to turn on you fast, but um, you just, if, if this is what I'm gonna lean into, then I have to accept bad with the good and understand that people have a way, this is their forum to express themselves. And sometimes the way they express themselves might not be the way I feel comfortable hearing, so I need to take a breath, try and understand where they're coming from, and then respond with some empathy. And that's how I've dealt with it myself. It. And, and Greg, I've been you know, following you for a while, and I was intrigued by your approach to um, what had been uh, 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 the, the, the First Avenue streetcar. It had been sort of been dormant now for a couple of years. And you took a, a completely different approach to looking at that and, and almost reviving that idea single-handedly. Can you tell us about that? Sure. You know. Um... I definitely, as I joined the agency and looked at kind of what was on the shelf, I felt like, you know, the streetcar is a strategically important project for the agency. And I thought it really deserved like a fresh shot, like a fair shot. And um, a lot of my practice uh, involves getting out on the street rather than receiving PowerPoints in the office. So I asked the streetcar team, you know, send me the PowerPoint the night before and then take me for a walk. Walk me the entire alignment of this missing streetcar segment. And it was a beautiful Friday afternoon um, in the late summer or late, late September. And by the end, I felt like I saw something. I felt like I saw sort of a linear entertainment district that could revitalize greater downtown. And that, you know, the, the full streetcar alignment could connect the market with historic Pioneer Square with all the wonderful restaurants in the CID and then our LGBT community and all the nightlife in Capitol Hill. And um, I kind of imagined sort of paying $5 in an app and having all day hop on, hop on, hop off rights. And someone who could get off, who would get off like a cruise ship wouldn't even have to know what our transit system is or what an Orca card is. They could just download the streetcar app and use the streetcar uh, to get around to all these wonderful places. And so basically the idea was to kind of lift up a different type of return on investment. 
that it isn't just getting people from this place to that place, filling this missing transportation link, that it's actually an organizing principle for a, a vibrant downtown in an era of remote work. And then part of what was really fun is I started leading these streetcar walks, taking other people on the experience I had. And that's been a very organic way to kind of gradually build a stakeholder interest in this idea. And um, then I appeared on your podcast and we forgot our first piece of media this week on The Urbanist, and we never asked for it. And we never asked DSA to officially go on the record supporting it either. That happened organically. So uh, it's been kind of like exper experimenting with a new way to pr promote a public policy through kind of like word of mouth and excitement rather than, um, you know, sending a PowerPoint through the council. Yeah, and I think that can be really effective. And I, I don't know if it's just Seattle, but I said earlier, you know, Seattle loves a good idea. And that notion of this, I think, what you call the cultural connector mm -hmm. and a, a, a linear entertainment district. I, I mean, where do I sign up? I think that sounds like a, a terrific idea. Um, we have a, one of the questions in the in the chat function is about um, potential congestion on First Avenue with a streetcar and the idea of um, instead routing out along the waterfront. Is that something that's is that still in, is that a possibility at this point to examine? No, because we we just invested seven hundred fifty million dollars in redesigning the waterfront. So we're not <laughs> tear that up. Um, to be honest, First Avenue is miserably congested now. Like every time I'm in a car and somebody takes me up First Avenue through Pioneer Square, I'm like, why? Why are you taking me here? Um, Pioneer Square is great on foot and lousy by car. So uh, I think there's other uh, north south. Uh, you know, ways to get around if you're driving. But I think that uh, First Avenue should become a very pedestrian oriented, vibrant uh, ground floor scene uh, for people rather than for vehicles. I'm glad you mentioned the waterfront. I mean, there's so much, and you mentioned this earlier too, I think there's just so much dynamism there and so much positive change. Yet there's still, you know, many, many years to go in terms of it's full, in, before it's fully built out and fully realized as a vision that connects where the viaduct used to be with the market and everything like that. Um, and there's definitely some overlap between transportation and parks, I think, along the waterfront and, and the, the First Avenue and up into the Pike Place Market and Steinbrook Park. Um, and this came up when, you, when we got together earlier to, to talk about this, this program today. There seems to be a sense of collaboration between these agencies, both the city and the state, um, that either it just wasn't really on the table before. It seems like there's this new era of public servants leading big agencies like you guys do and being far more visible. It almost reminds me of about 30 years ago when we had a Seattle superintendent of schools named John Stanford, who um, I mean, you'd ask first graders knew the name of the superintendent of the school district, which I don't, I don't think many first graders know who that is nowadays, but there was this sort of highly visible role, which um, it wasn't just some sort of self aggrandizing way of, you know, calling attention to yourself. There's strategic goals in mind of, of, of fueling people's imagination and showing that all sorts of things are possible, whether it's the day-to-day -day or these big picture things. So where do you see the potential for collaboration um, on the waterfront, for instance, in terms of the park experience versus the transportation issues that are inherent in that, in that project? A AP, do you want to take a whack at that? Yeah, absolutely. I'm so glad you mentioned the waterfront. Um, you know, the waterfront is going to add 21 acres of parkland to our city. And I was just typing a comment in the chat uh, to one of the <clears throat> questions that came back about how do we develop new park spaces? How do we look at freeway lids? And, you know, the transformation along the waterfront is huge. And all of us really have to be thankful for uh, the city, state, local leaders that came together before us to even imagine and realize this project. Uh, because I think decades ago, it probably would never have melded so well together. <clears throat> the ability for the state and local uh, system, you know, to convince transportation, to remove the viaduct, to find alternative routes and to open up and give back this land uh, to the citizens in a way that supports health and wellness and uh, aesthetic beauty, civic pride. It really is going to be transformational for this city. And now it's only two years away. That's not a very long time at all. Um, and so I think people can get more and more excited uh, as we get closer to that. I'm so impressed and excited for the development and creation of new park spaces. We're actually building parks on top of piers um, and using uh, the water and the infrastructure of a pier 
uh, through pylons uh, that go down to the to the glacier levels, by the way, uh, of, as a foundation base, which I was blown away by, um, to create, you know, living, abundant, thriving park space above, uh, you know, transportation uh, is supporting us and creating new uh, modality modes for bikers and for parkers uh, and cars. And then, of course, the ferries that have to coexist in this space. But at the end of the day, although there will be all of these infrastructure realignments, um, really what people will notice is a beautiful park system. Um, and we're so excited to welcome that as uh, one of our newest park projects uh, with all the city collaboration that's going on. So that is super, super exciting. I'd like to offer a prediction that this summer is going to be off the hook on the waterfront. It's not two years away. It's five months away. When the weather gets warm, people are going to experience these new walkable, bikeable uh, places. Um, you know, AP and I were both at the opening of the stairs that just opened um, that are, with a beautiful art element there. Um, literally, people are going to like look to the left as they're walking through downtown and see that afternoon sun that you couldn't see uh, because the viaduct used to block it. And they're just going to be beckoned down there. Uh, I think it's going to be really incredible, the um, public embrace by both Seattleites and tourists of the waterfront this summer. Yeah. yeah and if I can jump in on that, because as long as we're, we're jumping on the bandwagon here, the 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 use of parks, there, there's so many studies out there now that talk about the access and the accessibility of parks having so much of a benefit on our communities, but also on our individuals, on families, on children, to be able to have that psychological and physical health impact, emotional health impact of access. When you look at what Sound Transit has, the, the regional connectivity of our routes, what Seattle has and what King County Metro has with the local connectivity and how those connect into the bike and how those connect into the walk, to be able to get people to these parks without having to use their car, without having to worry about parking, to be able to get on with youth fares being zero so you can take your family and the entire family can go and enjoy these parks and enjoy that waterfront. Uh, we just need to get the word out that these are incredibly interconnected systems that have a positive impact on our economy, on our health, on our prosperity, and they're for everyone and they're accessible to everyone. Um, more or less, we have we do have some work to do. Greg and I, and I'm, I'm sure AP and I will talk more in the future about how to continually improve our sidewalks and our accessibility. But there's something someone asked me very recently is how does this area compare to others when it comes to transit and parks and all of that? Because don't we have so much work to do? Coming from the East Coast, from an area that doesn't have as many parks, as many what we have here, I'm like, I don't know that people here realize, people who've been here their whole lives, how good it is. Yeah, they have a high bar, high expectations, and we should strive to meet it. But let's celebrate how amazing it is here. We have a lot of good assets and a lot of good connectivity in parks. Yeah, and like just, I mean, the uh, the stairs you mentioned, the new stairs down at the bottom of Union Street, I think. I didn't go to the opening, but I went down the next day, and there were, I don't know, dozens of people using those stairs I don't, who had no idea they were brand new. They were just organically connecting between downtown and the waterfront, and it made perfect sense. Um, in terms of uh, like transportation, obviously a huge factor in Seattle's past, present, and future, and downtown transportation in particular. Um, is there a, an update to the downtown transportation plan, or what's the, Greg? What's the what's the status of that, or what what's what's next for that? So you know we're in the process of. Uh, building with the public a new Seattle transportation plan where we are bringing together uh, plans that had previously been around different modes. There was a pedestrian plan and a bike plan and a transit plan. And now we're trying to integrate them all into a modern uh, transportation plan. There's a lot of community input that's being taken, a lot of opportunities to plug in. I can put a link in the chat on how people can learn about that. And it's also linked up with the general plan update that's going on in Seattle. Uh, so there's a lot of great opportunities for the public to both talk about land use and transportation and a future vision for that. And one thing that's really fascinating is the commute is changing and we're not entirely sure if it's changing permanently or still kind of a hangover from the pandemic. Um, it's kind of a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday commute these days. 
and Monday to Friday is very light. And um, I just saw that New York City, um, they have to like publish their schedules for their workers like six months in advance. So they're thinning out staffing on Monday to Friday in the subway next summer to add more service on the weekends. They're actually making like a structural service change in response. So an area of great collaboration between SDOT, Sound Transit and King County Metro is how do we understand changing, you know, needs and demand patterns and respond to them uh, knowing that they might change further. That's great. Um, we have a question in the chat about the I-5 LID. Is that, uh, was a question on that one here. Let's see here. I don't have the details on that one. Um, before we go to that question, um, you guys have each been here about three months. Um, I'm sure you, you all have high energy and you're all deeply connected to the community in just a short period of time. I want to hear from each of you sort of what you see, what are the unexpected challenges? I mean, every, obviously every city has has things that are uh, headwinds when they're trying to make progress on on public projects and delivering services. But what things in the three months you've been here, what are sort of the unanticipated headwinds you've run into or what, are, what do you see are the, the big challenges for getting done the kind of things we're talking about here this morning? Do you want to start, AP? Sure. I think... I think the biggest challenge is, uh, as I was referencing earlier, coming out of this Metropolitan Park District funding process, now beginning to ramp up our delivery plan uh, to keep the public engaged and aware so that they know uh, which projects are starting, uh, why other projects may not be starting. I think there's this expectation uh, that everything's going to start all at once. And while we are going to start a lot at once, um, obviously there's going to be approaches and phases uh, to get the work done. So I think beginning to inform the public on what that plan is going to look like. There were a lot of things really packed into that legislation, um, and that's going to be the biggest challenge. But again, it's like an it's an exciting challenge because it means we get to be more engaged with our park constituents and uh, people love to talk about parks. So I'm excited to share that story coming up, but that's one of the things that's at the forefront of our operations coming in 2023. Okay. And um, let's go back to this lid question I wasn't able to find before. The question is from the audience. Um, and this is kind of a combination of parks and transportation question. What are you doing to proactively move the I-5 lid project forward and what specific considerations would you apply from your expertise Surface streets, transit, parks, and open space, et cetera. Who wants to who wants to take a whack at that? I'll start with that. Um, I did a walking tour with the Lid the Five group uh, recently. Um, you know, the we built this freeway down the center of our community, right? We split First Hill from downtown, and we split Capitol Hill from downtown. And and I'm I'm constantly frustrated as a pedestrian, like hiking up these these overpasses over I-5, um, I always want to get into these neighborhoods, First Hill and Capitol Hill, and it, the combination of the uphill and the freeway as a barrier is very frustrating. Um, and if you think about it, you know, when you build a freeway, not only do you separate communities, but you take all this land out of tax revenue, right? You don't ever make any another dollar off that land. So in a, in a region that is housing constrained, that's growing, that needs new homes for new Seattleites, I love the idea of, um, you know, putting some new sort of land atop parts of I-5, having some of it be park, but having some of it be housing that actually generates tax revenue. Um, I think that's pretty exciting. If you can suppress the noise and pollution, you can create new housing and park opportunities and create new revenue and new jobs. Uh, that all sounds pretty exciting to me. Okay. Um, let's go to a couple more questions from the chat box here. And um, this is about, this is to AP. Um, can you make changes to the SPU and park staff contracts to mandate they have teams that clean difficult terrain and encampments and hillsides? I'm just reading that. I was going to type my uh, response and I responded back to a couple of other chats uh, earlier. Thank you for uh, sending in that question, uh, Rebecca. I will look into that and find out what sort of challenges are preventing maintenance crews from doing that work. Um, and so I'm jotting that down now uh, and I will learn 
more about that. Um, and I, I just want to make a general comment. I think uh, all of us know that uh, any kind of contract that gets into place, um, you know, contracts are negotiable and and terms can be effectuated that best benefit the city. So just because we've done something the same in the past doesn't mean we're bound to do that in the future. And um, so excited to make change where it's possible uh, if it's serving a public benefit. So I will definitely look into that, Rebecca. Okay. And um, AP, um, you talked about this, um, the notion of Seattle shines. I want to make sure we get to that before we run out of time. So um, as I said before, Seattle loves a good idea. Seattle loves a good catchphrase, I think. Um, so what, what what is Seattle shines for those who may not have come, not come run across that yet? <clears throat> it's really the notion that, you know, this park has so much amazing uh, natural beauty, uh, as you know, Julie was mentioning too. I think when you have an outside perspective looking in on a city, it really adds some value. Um, you know, over time, people sort of get accustomed uh, to their cities, their environment. That's just natural. Um, I was struck by two things. One, this is the evergreen state in the Emerald City. Both of those references involve parkland, beauty, uh, the naturalness of Washington. And so when I think about the park system in Seattle, and again, this notion that everyone has their favorite park or a place to run or go to or hang out, I realize that the park system is really the shining part of our city. And even in the dark days, even when it's gray um, and rainy, I'm just enthused to see how many people are out about in parks, participating, doing life. And so I envision our park department as being the shining example of happiness, of health, of wellness, uh, shining all year round and being a place that really highlights uh, the values of the city, the equity that parks provide. It's a shining example of a lot of good that can come together through parks and uh, and park systems are microcosms of, you know, uh, democratic public spaces. They're open for everyone. They require no membership or special status. And I think that's the goal we want to get to into society and, and really sort of these common connectors that unite us. And so uh, Seattle Shines is, uh, is the motto and tagline for our park system. Maybe you can get Geno Smith to say that at the end of the next Seahawk game instead of uh, they wrote me off and I didn't write back. I don't know if have you trademarked Seattle Shines yet. Do you have the web domain purchased yet? <laughs> Thank you. And uh, don't everyone rush out and get that. We are working on that. And in fact, the mayor, uh -oh. the mayor quoted me the other day. So um, I thought that it, it's taking off. So <laughs> that's great. That's good to hear. Um, on a real specific granular level, um, can you give us an update on what's going on at Victor Steinbrook Park and the timeline and what changes people will see there over the next eight or nine months? Yes, Victor Steinbrook uh, uh, Park is uh, just closed uh, in the end in December of 2022. It's going to be open in fall of 2023. It's an approximate $8 million investment. So we're we're doing a lot of improvements that the public won't necessarily see uh, at first glance, but we're supporting a lot of the retaining walls. There's new roofs and membranes and really strong infrastructure support. And then we will begin to rebuild the park through design. Uh, this park is unique. We'll be working really closely with our indigenous populations um, to be a focal point of looking out onto the Salish Sea and um, sort of integrating uh, attributes that demonstrate our recognition that we are stewards to this parkland, that we're caretakers. So really excited about it. But 2023 uh, in the fall is when we are set to complete the project. And it's just going to be another beautiful addition uh, to what's happening uh, for park and public space, uh, you know, near the sound. And also uh, just a reminder that uh, it's one of the projects, again, that's that I was talking about that's coming online, but that's what the public can expect to see. Did you ever visit Steinbrook Park when the viaduct was still in operation? <clears throat> I did in 2017. Okay. Yeah, uh, and, and I was in 2017 when people told me that the viaduct was going to go away and there was going to be this amazing park. I, I could not imagine it um, and so excited to see it coming together now. 
Yeah, I mean, it's the, the views were the same essentially, but it was just a lot louder <laughs> before before the viaduct went away. Um, but so so lots of great potential there for connecting down to the, it, it will connect to the market front more directly, I think, at the south end of the park, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Up yeah. then towards public uh, uh, public market uh, and then uh, pikes. And then we'll also just really quick, if you all don't know, we are building a brand new addition to uh, the aquarium, which will be the ocean pavilion. But the exciting thing about that, many exciting things, is that there's going to be another huge public park space above the aquarium um, that will then connect to the other areas there. So again, adding more park spaces in non-traditional approaches. Um, and there will be an entire viewing of the aquarium for people below uh, through the park. You don't even need to go into the aquarium. There's going to be a huge uh, glass aquarium wall that will be part of the inside, but you get to see it from the street and enjoy it every single day. That's super exciting. See, you know, in in talking to all three of you and this this sort of theme of these these generational investments, um, these almost like not exactly siloed things because everything's obviously connected um, in downtown Seattle, but it it almost if you add it all up, it it almost feels like something like as big as a I don't know a World's Fair or an Olympic bid or something like that. I mean, we're I don't think in my lifetime we're going to see Seattle throwing another World's Fair or seeking to host the Olympics. Um, but it seems like a lot of the infrastructure that's being focused on now and that you know money is, is being devoted toward, it adds up to something pretty huge. Um, and I don't think the public fully appreciates that. I don't think the public gets that, gets it kind of summed up for them in a way that lets them appreciate how the money's being spent and what it will result in. And maybe because it's gonna take you know X number of years to get there, maybe, maybe that's the challenge. Um, but I think it's it's sort of, when I, when I worked at the chamber 30 years ago, George Duff was the president and he always said like, it's a parade. You, you couldn't just, you can't just give your speech once and forget about it. You got to just, it's a constant drumbeat. And he was saying that before social media existed. So maybe, uh, maybe that was, maybe that's the key is just this constant um, sharing this narrative and spreading the story. Um, and uh, hopefully it'll be ready in time for the world cup, right? The waterfront and the aquarium. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, we do have big things coming. We have the World Cup. We have the All-Star Game. We're going to That's be right. hosting yeah. the Asia Economic uh, Summit here as well in a couple of years. So there are a lot of big initiatives coming, and that just inspires me and my colleagues on the panel to, to really get together and do the work that we need to do so that we can shine during that period <laughs> and for Seattle every day, even <laughs> not in major events. <laughs> very clever. Now you work that in very nicely. That, that's pretty good. Uh, we got to see if uh, SDOT and um, Sound Transit come up with their own con their competing taglines for Seattle Shines. A um, couple more things on the, I want to get to before we run out of time is, um, Greg, on the, the Vision Zero update, I know that's an important project you've been spending a lot of time and sharing information about. And can you, can you kind of tell us what that is and what that looks like? For sure. So, you know, this summer as I was preparing to um, to move into the job, uh, I really did want to do a listening tour to understand Seattle streets before I made some decisions about um, transportation. But it was pretty clear to me that we needed to take a real deep look at the Vision Zero program to reduce uh, killed and seriously injured um, from traffic uh, deaths, particularly uh, are vulnerable of uh, folks walking, biking, and rolling who are not surrounded by a car. Um, you know, a lot of um, money's been spent and a lot of like industry standard smart interventions um, have been implemented, but the numbers are going in the wrong direction. And I felt we needed a hypothesis as to why that was and what we should be doing differently. So on September 7th, on my first day on the job, I commissioned a 90-day um, Vision Zero top to bottom review. Uh, it took about three weeks to get that staffed up. So basically, October, November, and December, that review has been taking place. Uh, it's a set of recommendations from an independent set of staff who don't operate our Vision Zero programs, a recommendation from them to me. And we're going to be publishing it as a draft um, uh, in about January 10th. And we hope to have it heard at the Transportation Committee of the City Council on January 17th and then take it to each of our advisory boards, the pedestrian board, the bike board, the freight board, the transit board, um, and have sort of a month of dialogue around the recommendations and findings in that draft. 
and then we'll finalize it in late February. And that will give us um, a really uh, sort of a guiding path uh, towards making investments in safety. And I, I believe that the report will highlight um, the collaboration that we need with um, Sound Transit, King County Metro, Seattle Police Department, WASHDOT. Um, we all need to really lift up safety as a top priority. Um, and I do think that this new generation of leaders are willing to collaborate around shared goals in a much deeper way um, so that we can unlock solutions to issues around people crossing the street at a freeway on ramp or you know how hard it is sometimes to get our transit riders on and off the platform uh, on MLK. Um, so I'm really, really excited to have the city kind of rally around something everyone can agree on, um, which is the need for safety. Um, I don't know, Julie, do you want to chime in on that? On the need for safety? Top yeah, and the collaboration we can have together. <laughs> And absolutely, I know that the, that our teams have already been very closely collaborating on a lot of safety initiatives. Um, uh, there is there's always room to improve, and I think that my team right now I expect to have within a month a list of projects that we'll be looking at prioritizing in 2023 along the entire system that looks at safety initiatives along MLK and looks at increased security in our system that looks at increased cleanliness because sometimes it's a matter of some of the external factors of uh, the cleanliness of the system that increases the safety of it, oddly enough, to have uh, additional staff in there for the fair ambassadors to help with that, which increases people's perception of safety, to have increased numbers of people that we're hiring to help when people are having a mental or emotional crisis, that when that's on our system, to increase that. These are things that Sound Trans is doing, but I want to kind of lean into this idea that it is a we. It's not a you or an us, it is a we. Um, a lot of times we'll get these questions, Sound Transit, what are you doing? Greg, what are you doing? Julie, what are you doing? AP, what are you doing? And the question is, is it's not what each of us are individually doing. It's that our teams are working together collaboratively what we are doing and what we're doing with the community and how we can involve the community in safety because if the, the, the whole burden of safety is put on the three of us um, that leaves out everyone actually using the system. So we have to have this collaborative approach to what are we doing to do safety? I've got my part, Greg has his part, our staff are working together. King County Metro has their part, we're working with them. WashDOT has their part, we're working with them. We're all working together. And now how do we partner with our riders and our drivers and our pedestrians to make this we successful? Got it. And um, Julie, while we got you, I want to get an update on the downtown tunnel and the West Seattle Ballard connection. That's, I know a lot of people are thinking about that. Of course. So right now our team took a, a break. I bet, I think it was back before I got here. So the board asked that the team look at additional alignments and alternatives for West Seattle Ballard Link and how it goes through the um, Seattle. We are coming back with alternatives. Those are starting to come out and be presented to our board and the community in the January and February timeframe. We have public meetings. We've had a lot of public meetings the last couple of months to develop additional alternatives and concepts. The board will be looking at those. The public will be looking at those in January, February, and March. And I'm, I'm very hopeful that we'll have enough information that we can start making some decisions on what alternatives we should be moving forward with for the West Seattle Ballard Link Extension Project in that March April timeframe. So we can get the engineering on track. We can get construction started in the next few years and get these uh, back in the pipeline to be delivered to the public, which as Greg mentioned earlier, the accountability, accountability to deliverable, delivering these projects is very high. However, we don't wanna rush so fast into putting something in the ground that we don't have the ability to have our, our Team members, SDOT, the parks, WashDOT, our communities, CID, Pioneer Square, Ballard, West Seattle, make sure that they also have input and buying to these processes. So the update is get involved in the process, watch January, February, March, where we talk about the next steps. Any sneak preview? No. <laughs> <laughs> Darn, I tried to sneak that past. You did. Right. You tried we are, we are just about out of time. I want to give each of you a few seconds to tell me Tell me that the the nicest thing that surprised you the most about Seattle when you can when you, over the last three months you've been here. Uh, AP, what's what surprised you the most about Seattle? Well, 
it shouldn't be a surprise. And again, this is sort of the outside perspective. Um, the, you know, the surprising factor is just being able to see some aspect of nature at every turn. And what I mean by that is I'm still amazed. I'll, I'll be in, you know, sort of the north part of the city coming south on the five and see the city emerge right now. You can see, you know, Mount Rainier, uh, or you could uh, last week. Um, I'll be going out in Magnolia. I see the Olympics. Um, I come on to Portage Bay. You know, I come on to Lake Washington. To me, that's just, it's really inspiring. I, I didn't realize you would be able to see all those aspects of nature um, in one sort of fell swoop or turn. And that has been really exciting. And I'm also just impressed with how the city looks. And a lot of people have been surprised for me to say that in terms of our downtown areas, our neighborhoods. Um, it's a testament to a lot of work that's been done post pandemic. And I'm definitely aware there's a lot more work for us to do as a city, but really just uh, so not not only the natural beauty, but to me, the beauty of the city, the, the buildings, the signages, um, you know, uh, the link moving through downtown, all of those things just add to this sort of shining city by the sea. And I I'm just I love being here and nice. I'm excited. I like how you said the five, like a guy from L.A. So congratulations. Um, Thank you. You, you, gave, you gave yourself away. And just a few seconds quickly, Greg, tell me tell me something that surprised you the most about Seattle. You know, I've been really thrilled by the civic engagement of the business community that's right here on this call. Um, we didn't have that in Los Angeles. And I feel like there's really great partners in the business community who are concerned with more than just the front door of their particular establishment. Um, I went to the you know chamber event last week and continuously talked to people for three hours. And I thought, wow, I guess I've gotten to know a lot of people in the three months I've been here. So I'm very excited about what we can all accomplish um, pulling together. Very nice. And Julie, just a few seconds. I feel like I should just say ditto. It's <laughs> all the above, the, it, right. you know, the beautiful, it's awe-inspiring, the, the nature that you see here. The, the interconnectivity of our, of our systems and how easy it is to use them, the openness of people, regardless of the fact that people talk about Seattle Freeze, uh, all of that together has been incredibly surprising, impressive, and just inspiring in so many ways. And I'm just, I'm thankful for the reception. I'm thankful to be here. All right. I want to thank our panelists, AP Diaz of Seattle Parks and Recreation, Greg Spots of Seattle DOT, Julie Tim of Sound Transit, I want to thank everyone for joining us today for this edition of DSA Virtual Access. Thanks, as always, to the fabulous DSA staff, John Scholes, Sally Wright, James Cito, and Emily Baylor. Now, keep an eye on your inbox for information about other upcoming DSA programs in the new year, virtual and in-person, or visit the website downtownseattle.org for more information anytime, and you'll find a link there to John Scholes' incredible Seattle City Maker podcast. Check that out. Uh, put a note on your calendar for State of Downtown. Um, that's going to be March 14th, 2023 already. Uh, until we meet again, I'm Felix Bunnell on behalf of DSA, and thanks for joining us this morning. Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy New Year, and we will see you downtown. <laughs>